do out when he pulls you out. All right, this morning I want to talk to you about He Romances Us. And I want us to start in Ezekiel 16. And verse 4 is where we're going to start. And it says, And as for your birth, on the day that you were born, your cord was not cut nor were you washed with water Jesus. to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in swallowing cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you and out of compassion for you. And that word compassion means commiserate, which is the same thing as sympathize, spare, or pity. But you were cast out on the open field. And right there, that open field is the same word that's used in Ruth 2 through 3 where she went to glean in the fields. And that field right there needs to spread out. And it says where you were abhorred on that day that you were born. So right there, no one had any love for you because you were despised in the way that you were born. You were cast out. But the Lord this morning, because He is love, He romances you even when no one wants you. And let's get down to verse 8. And it says, when I passed you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age of love. And to love means to boil a lover, a token, and a friend. And we know in the book of Ruth that the name of Ruth means a companion or a friend. And at the beginning, Naomi called her daughter, which there, that daughter just meant friend. And that you're just, oh, you're just related to me somehow. But when Ruth took on the identity of love in God, that new word, even though it still says in English, daughter, she now became the apple of my eye. Yeah. That's what that meaning just changed to. And it says, if you were the time of love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness, just like Boaz covered Ruth. And I made... My vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. Hallelujah. Mine. Lord, he romances us. Hallelujah. And then I bathe you with water, very washed you in the word, yes. and washed off your blood. Yes. So everything that was carnal, we washed off of you. Yes. And anointed you with oil. And I clothed you also with embroidered cloth, and shod you with fine leather, and I wrapped you in fine linen, and covered you with silk. Now right there, he started to put the priest on you, like the linen ephod. Yeah. And that word linen means to be bleached white. And the word white means glory, or the light of God. So when you take on the priest role, you're being clothed in his life. Amen. Hallelujah. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Now right there, he's making her a king. So he's putting king and priest on her to make her a full son of God. And then thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. And you ate fine flour and honey and oil. And let's stop right there. Because the word flour is to strip or to make clean. So that's like when the north wind came in in Song of Solomon. And the myrrh came on her and cleansed her. And the word honey. So she ate flour, honey, and oil. The word honey means to be gummy or sticky. It started, the word of God, after he stripped her, started sticking to her. Right. And then the oil means to shine or to grease or to polish, like when he refines us with the gold. And right there, see, that is the pureness of like the eagle, like when he calls us eagle saints. Because when an eagle becomes purified, when he started to become old, he'll take himself, he'll pluck every single one of the feathers out right. of him. Yeah. And, you know, and he looks, doesn't even look like an eagle. All he's got is his skin and his beak. And he'll sharpen that, tap that beak, and he'll
he'll sharpen those talons. And then as he's become cleansed, all of a sudden, the oil will start flowing all over his back. So his skin can become renewed. And he can take on those new feathers. So if you're evil saint, you're being cleansed. You're being stuck with the word of God. And then you're being purified as gold. So I encourage you to daily eat the word of the flower, the honey, and the oil. Hallelujah. And if we back up some, referring to the garments, right there the garment is, we know, just like the eagle, it's taking the edge of the extremity, the flap, the wing, the uttermost part, and even withdrawing you out. So when you think, my goodness, I don't know if I can get to where I need to be in God. This world is pulling on me so hard. People are condemning me because I'm in this new work. My Lord, the Lord just takes you out. Takes you out just like in Psalm 91 where he puts you in a high place. And it says that he spreads you with his wings. Let's go back to verse 14. Or actually 13, right after the oil. And you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced in royalty. And you renowned... And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But you trusted in your beauty, and you played the whore. And that right there is the same word that he uses for Gomer in the book of Hosea. And right there, you know, the Lord caused Hosea to fall in love with Gomer because that represented the church. We know that. It represented the church, and he loved on her. And she still kept playing the whore, even though she was so beautiful. She had to be beautiful. She had a bunch of lovers. And she kept going back and forth and back and forth. But the Lord says, you know, play the whore because of your renown. And lavish your whoreings on the passerby. And your beauty became his. <laughs> so sometimes when that whore, it go, you know, you're going out, you're committing adultery. And that, another word for that is idolatry. Yeah. You're putting things before the Lord. But you know what? He don't stop romance. No, because he's love, and he loves us no matter what we do. He's going to call on himself. And you think that you've got to try so hard to be in this word, and all you got to do is rest. Just like in Psalm 23 where he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Well, you know that word green means to flourish and to be planted in him. So if he makes us lay down in the green pastures, then he makes us to rest. In him yes. and everything that he's made of him. So that's all you have to do is rest in him. You don't have to play the Lord. You let go of all that law, all that condemnation. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And we would know that God is a jealous God. Now that's one reason why I'm so mad at her there because he re renewed her and she started to become the Lord. And he said he's a jealous God. And see there, it connects with the groaning. It says our groaning for creation to become our one body is great. Because we are him, and he wants us to be him, to be hidden deep within him. He romances the whore of religion with truth of his love. So even you notice, you know, to other people, you don't have to say, well, come in here, you'll, you'll hear the truth, it's different. You don't even have to tell them. Because when they come in, they're going to realize the truth of his love there. So this is different. This isn't like those so-called church people that are always telling us, you know, well, you need to wear your hair a certain length, and you need to wear a dress for men. Maybe it's like you can't wear jeans or shorts to church or anything like that, you know. There's a truth in love, and the Lord's just going to take care of them anyway. And they're going to realize, they're going to be drawn. They think that they're, oh, I said yes because I was going to come to church. They think that, mm -mm, Lord knows all about it. He is them. So he's the one drawing them anyway. So it says that, you know, she's drawn to change her identity. She becomes his identity. That's what our main goal is, to become the identity. And just even going back to the book of Ruth, when Boaz, Boaz changed Ruth's identity the moment he found favor. And especially really changed the identity when he covered with a skirt. Because that skirt, again, it means to withdraw out. And so he had already withdrawn her out. So when he went to the law, he went to the gate and said, Law, you're going to take what's already mine? And the law was like, well, if I do that, i got to change my whole identity and my whole inheritance because I can't take her and, and the identity 
too. I got to hold on to this world and what they offer to me. So even going back to the financial realm, sometimes you're worried. You're like, my God, I get in here and and people are against me and I don't think I don't think I'm gonna make it. But my Lord, when you take on the identity of Him, He's got all the riches there is for you. He blesses you because you honor Him. Amen. Hallelujah. And it says, so they they didn't even see that friend or companion anymore. They only heard what Naomi called her, apple of my eye. And that she became Boaz. And that name, Boaz, right there, Boaz means the pillar in front of the temple. Hallelujah. And we know, uh, Pastor Matt's been talking about the pillar. It wasn't there to support anything. It was just standing there. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that's another word. When I looked up that word pillar, that's what it just means, to stand up. That's all you got to do is just stand up Hallelujah. and be in the Lord. And you be in the Lord when you pray and you worship and you're in His Word and you rest in Him. Hallelujah. And so, hallelujah, and she started to trust herself and she took on that new identity of king and priest because she was the handmaiden. When the handmaiden, she wasn't, you know, she's got that little name, Odd. But Boaz was the king of like the city. So then she took on his identity, and she had her identity, and she put them together. And she got rid of all that that she had in Moab. Now let's go to, uh, let's see. <coughs> just look at 2 Samuel 6, 16 through 23. I'm not going to really read out of this, but we know that Boaz, was an ancestor of David. And actually, if you look up Boaz where he is in the Greek, that's what it says for him. And we know that David was after God's own heart. And this is the scene where David has become king, and they just brought back the ark of the Lord. So there was a completeness in the people. And we know that out there, while he, he put on the limb ephod, he was already king. See, that was, the, that was the problem with God's people. They had Samuel, who was the priest. that was always telling them everything they did wrong. And even though he was great for them, but they only had one role. And then they begged for a king. And then they had Saul, who took everything from them. And But, you know, he only had the role of the king. But then you see they got David. And David took on the role of the king and the priest. So there was completeness. And this was where Michael... He had married with Saul's daughter, and, he, and she saw him out there dancing before the Lord and worshiping the Lord and his lean ephod. She thought, my God, he just backed himself up from king and went to a priest. The thing was, even though he changed his clothes, his identity did not change at all. So he just took on both roles. And she's looking there, and she's despising him because she realizes, you know, even though she thinks he's just being the priest, she realizes he has the humility and to be with the Lord that she's ever had. Sure. Just like those old order people that tell you all the time, my Lord, look at you, you look crazy up there dancing. There isn't any dancing in the Bible. What are you talking about? There isn't tongues anymore. Like, you know, how can y'all have all that freedom and liberty in the Lord? You got to be this, this, and this. Because we got to be seen at church. No. My goodness. And that's what Michael was seeing in the spies of her heart. And often you ask, why was David so after the heart of God? You see, you know, when he took on both roles, every time he clothed himself in that linen ephod, he took on the both roles of the king and the priest. And just as in Ezekiel 16, when her nakedness was covered with the linen and the royal robes, just like the bride of Christ was taken on the identity, seen as perfection in the eyes of Melchizedek. And where we are clothed with light, life, and glory. Now even going to Ezekiel 37, <laughs> the valley of the dry bones. That's those situations. Not just, you know, people that are physically dead. That's those situations that we want to be changed, and they're dead, they're dry. They're all dried up, and it's back in that open field. But instead of like with Boaz, where you're with the king and you're feasting, and there's plenty for us to take, we see desolation there. But the Lord prophesied to Ezekiel there, and he said, told him to live. And where that spirit was used, that was the word for breath. So he's saying, breathe into them, give them life, take on the identity of who they are. And so right there, you know, you're clothing in the light.
life, the light, and the glory, just like the light of Utah. And you know, just like I said this when I preached the sunshine, just like I told him, you know, every time somebody dies on the side of the road, what if they cover with a linen white sheet? You think that, you know, they're just doing that to shield your eyes? Well, they are. They're taking away the death. All you see is life there. So, you know, take on that role. Dance for the Lord day in mind, brothers. And then, you know, no matter how much of that horror was inside of you, you know, once you let that go, that's the main thing is, you know, yeah, we come in here, but sometimes you're still, oh, Lord, what somebody's going to say. Somebody's going to bring up my past, and they're going to tell me what I've been doing. And, you know, and, you know, just like Michael was saying, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be looking like that for everyone. Nobody's supposed to see you like that. But my God, that's how people should see us. Hallelujah. Being humble and loving in life. Hallelujah. And loving Him. And um, so, you know, like those people especially, we know that, you know, the people that know us the best, they want to bring up stuff. My God, when I finally started to get redeemed, some of my friends were like, you were gothic in high school. You said you never served the Lord. You hated the Lord and all this stuff. And you did some stupid stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't even remember that stuff, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, like about a year ago, when I was going, you know, in high school, before I started serving the Lord, I was going through a lot of depression. And she, uh, and I guess she was having a little bit of depression, or one of her, no, it was one of her friends had committed suicide. And she said, Megan, what did it feel like when you wanted to commit suicide? And I said, I can't honestly remember. Because you know, in the Bible, it says the Lord takes away the memory and the sink of death. You know, I guess I wasn't feeling very good if I wanted to take my own life. But you know, I, I can't tell you what it was like. I can't really help you there, you know. I'm not that person anymore. I don't have that identity in the world anymore, you know? And so, um, just like Michael, you know, even when the snares, those people are saying, hey, uh-uh, you have got it. I don't know what you're talking about. They see you. They're like, you're messed up. You're a fall. Well, we know if we fall, oh, my Lord, we fall on the ground. We fall into the great pastures. That's where he renews us, you know? When we, we forget what, you know, just like in the books that we've been reading on monkeys and dragons. We don't look up at the dragon. We don't look to the side where the monkeys are. We fall on our face before the Lord, and all we see is Him and His light and His flourishing. And, you know, Michael there, you know, she had on that old order identity, and she didn't know how to take on the inheritance of the Lord. And it even says in verse...
the stronger the bride becomes. Hallelujah. And, and we know that if she would have done that, she would have forgot the old order. You know? And all that hatred would have been just broken off because the truth takes away, again, it takes away the sting of death and it takes away the condemnation. Like they talked about, there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ in Romans 8 1. Hallelujah. Jesus. And we know that um, because David took on that, he sang many songs before the Lord, and I'm sure he danced on every one of them about praying that he was before his face before the Lord. <laughs> and one psalm I want us to look at this morning is Psalms 86. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Now you know what? That's wrong. He was, he, but he was so desolate from the Lord right there. He couldn't see his inheritance. So this must have been one of the down times for him. And preserve my life where I am godly. Oh, he's starting to get his identity back. And save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For you do I cry all, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Just like when Ruth went into Boaz, when he was on the threshing floor. She thought that she was at her lowest because Naomi was saying, Oh, God's got to redeem us. I know you're finding favor, but he's got to redeem us. And she went in there, and he covered her soul with his identity. Hallelujah. He took the woman, Suke, and covered her soul with his identity. Hallelujah. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. And we know there's like there's a song. And it's called, Oh, How He Loves Us. And there's a verse that says, He is jealous for us. And if grace is an ocean, we must be sinking. So, you know, we might think, Oh, Lord, He can give us grace when we first come to Him. We first get saved. We first take on His name. But that grace never ends. It's an ocean. It just keeps going and going and flowing with the Word. The Word keeps falling over you. You never sink. You know, even when Peter doubted, when he was up on the water with the Lord, and he started to sink in the water, the grace hit him. The water hit him of grace. Hallelujah. And the Lord just picked him up and put him back in the ship and steered him on the way. Hallelujah. And in the day, we're in verse 7, and in the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. We know that. And there is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any words like you. Just like going back to Ezekiel 16, she played the war. She was trying to find love with everybody. She was committing adultery. She was committing idolatry with everyone. She was going out there and just saying, my goodness, I can have this idol. I can have this idol. And look, they love my beauty. But that beauty was not given by the world. It was given by God. So even though she thought she was spreading her beauty and identity and idolatry, she was really just giving them a piece of God and they didn't even know it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And that fear is not... Not to be scared. Lord ain't over you with a baseball bat and hit you in the head every time you do something wrong. I fear is a matter of respect and then to worship. Hallelujah. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. Toward me, and you delivered my souls from the death of Sheol. You know, Sheol is hell. Hallelujah. Hell doesn't have to exist in our world. In the kingdom of God, Hallelujah. He's taken away that. Hallelujah. You know, hell's that, that box of that mind that's there saying, you must be a beast. But the beast comes out of you, and you take off that, and you realize, oh, there's not any devil that's got to exist in my world. Hallelujah. The only truth and 
life and life because I'm clothed with the ephod of God and I'm dancing and worshiping before him and all I know is God, all I feel is God. My Lord, I'm getting drunk when I'm at work. What am I supposed to do? I dance around and other people are thinking, well, she's just happy today. <laughs> you're going down the road and you got your hand up praising the Lord in your car and people are thinking, what are they doing? Is there a bee in there? They're flying, but they, oh, but they got a smile on their face. Man, they must really like bugs or something. You know, just, you're just having a good time. Praising and worshiping the Lord. That's all right because you're taking all the role. You know, just like Pastor said, don't take that time when you're when you're going to work. Don't take that time just to, you know, well, what do I have to do today? That's where you take all the role of kingdom priest and it just stay with you all day. It's, you know, even just like Paul says, you pray without ceasing. So just keep praying. And and that doesn't have to be, Lord, we come before you today. No. No, your prayer is your worship. That's yeah. how we do every Thursday night. That's our worship when we come in. That's where we take on that role. Just like when Esther, my God, she came in the court and fell on her face. Yeah. And said, I petition you. And when, you know, at that day, a woman didn't do that. My God, she could have got her head cut off with a sword. You know? They were thinking, what is she doing? Just like Pastor was saying, what man is this? They were like, whoa, what is she doing? Why should she come up in this court? She doesn't, she's not the king. But see, she had the identity of her king. And she was already, she was raised up under um, oh boy, what's his name? Uh, her uncle. Yeah, Mordecai. Yeah, I knew it was her then. Um, Mordecai, he was the priest, he was a scribe, but he was also the priest because they looked to him for advice and things like that. That's what the priest does. He gives you direction in the way. He's the priest and the prophet. And so she already had the identity, you know, even people didn't think so because, the, you know, uh, Vashti, she was shunned even though she had, but see, she only had on the identity of the king. She didn't have a king and priest together. And she came forth of that court walking and fell before him, and, you know, she should have. But because she already had the identity, the king couldn't lose her. That's like cutting off his arm. He couldn't lose her. That's why he put the scepter in front of her and save her. He's like, my God, I can't cut off my own identity. I can't cut off my own inheritance, my own, my own child, my own bride. Can't do that. So let's go back, Ali. And in verse 14, in Psalm 86, Oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. Just like we were saying, those that want to always condemn. Just like the Pharisees of Jesus. What are you doing? You can't heal on the Sabbath. You know? Hallelujah. And it says, a band of ruthless men seek my life. God, I think of the Song of Solomon 3, where, you know, he left his dripping hand and was going to the door. And she's like, I got to have him. I got to go out there and they beat her up in the street. They try to take away her identity. They try to take away her beauty. Couldn't do that. Hallelujah. And they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. My God, there's Ruth and the handmaiden again. Hallelujah. No wonder he's a descendant of them. Hallelujah. And save the son of your maidservant. Hallelujah. There's Obed. But we know that from Boaz, there was Obed and Jesse and David. And it kept yeah. going even to us, the 42nd generation. Yeah. Hallelujah. And show me a sign of your favor. Mm. Boaz gives us favor all the time. Hallelujah. That those who hate me may see me and put, be put to shame. Just like Michael, she was put to shame. Hallelujah, because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. And you know, just like when Boaz spread that wing, and, you know, that skirt over her, and the king lowered the, the scepter, we know the rod and the staff, they comfort us. The wing, that's where we find comfort in the most high of the Lord. Hallelujah. And, you know, we often think that we are the ones seeking after him and drawing him unto us. And trying, we're the ones, we're trying to say, hey, no, 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 this is who I am. You don't know who I am. You're trying to defend your own self. But well, we know that the battle is the Lord's, and he takes care of it himself. Hallelujah. He shuts the mouth of the lines of the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But since we are...
patterned sons of him, his bride in him. He makes us hunger for himself. So we are himself, so he hungers for himself. He brings more of himself right. in. That's all he wants is himself. Hallelujah. That's why his, his yearning, his jealousy is so great for us because that's all he wants is himself complete. Hallelujah. Jesus. And through his love. Hallelujah. And he loves us more than creation ever can. You think that you love creation so much. I really want to see them come in. But you know whether or not they come in, the groaning is still there. They might not come in through you, but my God, they'll still know who Jesus is. And even like that verse that says they they stay for a moment in hell, I admit, and I, I'm not fully clear on that verse, but some of the revelation I got on that verse is that they're there for a time. So that must be, hmm, the Lord must be romancing them and teaching those that even have gone on who they, who they are in Him. You know, it says they're there for a moment, a season. So they must be coming into the Lord, or at least having the knowledge and realizing that they're not really in Him. You know, like Pastor is saying, where, you know, let Lazarus dip his finger in the water and touch my tongue, the water of the Word, yeah. fire through the fire. So he must have been being burned up and, you know, just like we were talking about a meal of uh, fine flour, honey, and oil. And that oil is the part where you're being, you're being shined, you're being graced, you're being refined. So he was probably being burned up by that fire because his identity was being changed. Yeah. He didn't know how to, yes. oh God, he didn't know how to let go Hallelujah. of that identity of what he knew for so long. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that's why, you know, when we have that growth for creation, that's where, you know, that's where we have. Don't, don't because, you know, you've been redeemed from the condemnation. Don't start condemning others because you know where they need to be. You know, that's where you meet them in the groan of love. And you take, you can go and take that sin to death. You know, you can start putting your, your fragrance on them. Start showing them love. And hallelujah. As we take on, again, take on that love of be fought. Dance over them. My God, thank them. Don't just say, Lord, we pray that you'll come into their soul and give no. Just dance over them. Laugh over them. Hallelujah. Have joy over them. You'll start seeing changing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And take away the condemnation. Now, one last verse, or one section I want to focus on is, because um, this is a good one, is in Luke 23, and it's through 50 through 56. And this is right after Jesus had been buried. Hallelujah. It says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was a member of the council. Oh, Lord, he had government on him. But he wanted something else. A good and righteous man. He had not consented to decision and action, for he was looking for the kingdom of God. <laughs> He was looking for the kingdom of God. He wasn't just looking for the person, the man. He knew that Jesus was already the kingdom of God. That revelation was already getting on him. He had, you know, he was on the council, so mm, he, might, he might have been a Pharisee. I think he was. Hallelujah. So he had all that government and all that condemnation, but he wanted something more. And that man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud. There was a linen ink spot. Hallelujah. And laid him in a tomb cut in stone, and there was no one, and no one ever yet been laid. Hallelujah. And it was the day of preparation. Now we know that first preparation comes. You know, that's what that's what your dance over them is. Yes. The preparation so they can come into the promise sure. and full fruition. Yes. Fruition of him. Hallelujah. Just like the prodigal son. The, his father had prepared him his whole life. Yes. You know, he went out. And he started eating with the pigs. He was down in the most carnal you never get. Oh my gosh, they even eat, you know, the pig slop. You're down in the dirt. He thinks that his identity is completely changed. But then he remembered his father. And he came back to the promise that his father had been, been laying on him all that time. And he put, remember, his father, but not the grave. So, you know, for years he had been given that priest mentality. And then his father put on the robe, and he took on that king and priest. And again, there was the brother that was wanting to condemn again. He's like, Father, 
You never threw a party for me when I came to you. I've served you all these years. Just like old people that think you got to work to be in God. There's no work. It's a rest. Hallelujah. Mm. And so he took on that key priest, and then there was feasting. Because when you're resting in it, you're feasting in him. Hallelujah. Mm. And it says that the woman came with him from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Now they were still connected to that law. But we know, you know, Kelly Barner, he uh, wrote a book about the spices of the Lord. There's cowness and cinnamon. And there's another one, a myrrh. And he brought them together. And that was the priest's anointing. So they were laying on the priest. They were giving him a priest burial. But then again, you know, he was already the king. So they were doing that there. And we know that again, even going back to Esther there, you know, the Lord, he's got that light on him and everything. And we know from then on they moved into the Holy Ghost. But even going back to Esther and Ruth. When they took on those identities, they were taking those names to redeem the people. Now, Ruth, she started off as the condemned one from Moab. She didn't have the identity of Christ, but she yearned for it so greatly that I'm sure, you know, she redeemed her people, her future generations, but she took on the role of king of priest. And just like Esther, she already had it. She had that in her. She took on the role of the world, just like the Lord. He takes the sin. Takes the sin. She took yes. that role of the world. She changed her name to fit them. She became them and her people to death. Because she had both ideas, Hadassah and Esther. My God. She took on those both identities and she redeemed them and that snare of Haman, my God, remember he was Haman. Mm -hmm. He had that in for her uncle, for the priest. One to kill off the priest so there should be the king left and they That's wouldn't right. be complete anymore. Right. But no, he used the woman, the soul, Suke, to redeem it all. The soul, the go between both worlds of heaven and earth. Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just even going back, I want to touch some right where the uh, pastor was talking about the woman at the well. Does that even connect to some of you? The main verse is just focused on is 9 and 10. Or, sorry. Yes. 10 and 11. And that's where Jesus answered her because, you know, she's sitting there at the well, sitting on his own word, his own water. Hallelujah. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, hallelujah, and who it is that it is saying to you, give me a drink, and you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Yeah. Hallelujah. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Ooh, we call it deep under deep. Yeah. Hallelujah. Where do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Hallelujah, she's referring back to the government. He gave the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become to him a spring of water welling up. In eternal life. Oh, and the right. woman said to him, Oh, she's getting hungry. Right. She's being romance so much right there. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Hallelujah. She wanted that. They want that. Believe me, those people that are being condemned, even those in the old order, they know that there's something more. They know there's something more. That there's something, a lot of them, I'm starting to even hear some churches I visited that I know that are in the old order, they call it revelation word. It is revelation. It's that word coming to life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. They're taking on the water of the word. Hallelujah. And they're taking on that king and priest mentality. 
And they're becoming whole in Him because the love, the love and the truth of His love overtakes them to where they can never be. You know, they think that they have to lose so much in the Lord. They think they have to do these things all the time. That there's a list of rules. You know, there's no rules in Him. He's calling you deep unto deep in the water of His grace. Hallelujah every day. And there's one, well, I'm going to finish this here. It's just a prophecy the Lord told me to give. And it says, Come forth, O ye bride, break forth in the singing, for I have called you forth beyond your limitations. Ruth and Esther were limited, but they think the Lord fix that. I am the one causing all things to come into purpose. I am the one who romances you in my heavenly chamber to make you mine. So choose no other. Lay the whore no more. For I have chosen you. You are mine. There is no other that can love you more. Not even creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's just going to keep romancing you. Hallelujah. More and more each day. He'll take everything off that you need. Every limitation. Every stronghold, every condemner. He'll shut their mouths. He'll make them desolate. Hallelujah. He can redeem them as well. Hallelujah, that's the great thing. He can redeem them as well. And redeem every situation that you have. Amen.